Hello again, everybody. Uh, so this is where I I, uh, I started from Antigua uh, in Guatemala, and uh, and I and I went on a trip up to the Pacaya volcano, which is like a group of it's like a set of volcanoes, uh, and then there's the main one, and this is coming out of um, Antigua, and you can see one of the uh, major volcanoes straight ahead. Um, Guatemala is actually, you know, it's surrounded by a lot of active volcanoes. Actually, the day after I left, one of them started firing up again. And you can actually hear them at, at night. And um, uh, you can hear the crackle, crackle uh, they make. I went the wrong, I was going up the wrong way, one way street here. <laughs> Those guys in the car just informed me of that. So yeah, so it's a, it's made up of a series of volcanoes. Still, I don't know which way to go here. I think, oh, well, there's two ways, so off I go. Narrowly avoiding the car on the other side of the road. So it's a little bit weird when you, when you go on a day trip and you take off. I mean, I, I, have, I, I took off my, all my gear, so my, my packs were empty, but I had some camera equipment in there. I had my drone in there thinking that, you know, I'm gonna get up to the mountain and as you can see, it's a glorious day, but by the time I, for some strange reason, uh, by the time I got to the top of the mountain, there was blue sky everywhere except for on the mountain. I was just covered in. So I waited for about 45 minutes and um, it wasn't clearing. So the last, you know, the last uh, 400 metres, 500 metres up this single track was, um, was covered in uh, clouds, so it was useless. Um, but yeah, but it, it actually has a, when you actually take all the weight off the bike and you ride it, it actually has a um, a, a strange sort of feel to it because it's so, so much lighter, you know. You're probably taking off, uh, what's that, uh, the two side cases are about 7, uh, 10, 12, 14, 24, probably about 30, 36, 40 kilos off the bike. So it's a big difference, you know. Um, and turning and on the gravel, it's a big heavy bike anyway. Um, but it's 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 funny because when 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 I went to the airport at the end uh, at the end of the trip, there was a guy with a GS twelve hundred, a GS eight hundred, sorry, and, and he had it fully loaded when we put it on the crate and got weighted. His was actually heavier than mine. Uh, mine was about two hundred and ninety kilos fully loaded. His was. Um, I think 307, something like that. So, you know, the, the myth that the, uh, the KTM 1290 is, it is a big heavy bike, but in no way is it, um, is it as, uh, as heavy as the GS is fully loaded. Um, and you can actually, when you actually put them next to each other, the GS, whilst it's probably not quite as tall as the KTM, is a freaking big bike, you know. Um, and uh, you know it's a uh, it, it's also a wide bike, you know. Um, I mean they're great, great bikes. You know? And I always go back and I, I wonder where the guy was that made the decision not to uh, for KGM because remember back in I don't know if you've ever watched the long way uh, the long way round the first series with Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman, but um, the. You know, they really, Charlie really, really wanted the KTM. Um, uh, Ewan, Ewan was more, he, he more, was more on the BMW side, but really, you know, he would have been happy to have the KTM as well. But KTM ended up saying no. Um, first, I don't know what, what reason, the guy might not have, I mean, Ewan McGregor is a big, he's a big superstar, uh, Hollywood superstar. However, he's not that well known. If you actually, if you know, he's been in so many great movies and he's a great actor and he's, he's also, by watching that series, you can tell that he's a good fella too, you know? Um, and Charlie is too. Char Charlie's got a little bit more of a, Ewan's got a bit of a, oh well, whatever sort of temperament. And Charlie's sort of a little bit more highly strung and that, that's why it works so well between them. Um, and, uh, but you and the, and so the, the representative from KTM said, "Oh, well, I don't think you're going to do it." But really, they the guy who made that decision probably cost KTM half a billion dollars, 
if you look over the period of all those years where if I ride anywhere now, um, if you're a dirt bike guy, you're, you're riding a KTM. A lot, most of the time, you'll see most of them are KTMs. If you're a adventure rider, opposite way around. Most most people have the BMWs, and they're a fantastic bike. I mean, the only reason I I, I just rode at the BMW 1200 in Iceland. Uh, these guys let me ride ride one for only a few hours, but a great bike, you know. But when I got on the KTM, I was like, whoa, you know, the power it had. And it just felt like, it just felt like it just wanted to go, you know. And the thing about it is, is that whilst that's not really important, it just had that element of excitement that I just didn't have with the, uh, thanks for the guy driving in the middle of the road, um, the, the element of excitement that I just didn't feel with the BMW. Um, and I've got to say, most of the BMW riders I actually meet are a little bit envious of my bike. I don't know why, but maybe it's just me thinking that way. It might not be true. But, um, it, it, you know, most of them think that their, their bike's better, and that may well be. Um, and, you know, the, the thing about if you're going to own a KTM, and especially like a 990, 1190, 1290, and probably the same with the BMW, but everything's expensive, like, you know, I mean, I'm just getting the, the front, my front rim replaced. Because um, it, 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 although it's fine, it has a, it had a slow leak uh, from when I had that crash in uh, El Salvador, which is coming up soon. Um, and uh, it did have a slow leak, um, but and, and I could not fix it, even though the rim just looked perfect and everything, we just couldn't get it right. One Only one place got it right and, and sealed it correctly, and that was in, um, that was in uh, Ecuador, in Quito. Uh, the guys there uh, got it right. But other than that, every other service, when they put on the new tires or screwed around with it, they ended up with that slow leak again. It was such a slow leak at first, like maybe one PSI every few hours, which is very hard to detect. Um, but then once I started going, it got to be, you know, three PSI an hour, you know, up to four or five PSI, and it just became a nightmare, just stopping all the time. Um, and again, if, you, if you're going to go on an adventure ride, uh, a couple of the things that you're going to want is you want to have a, a uh, I mean, I have a battery as well, so I can, if, if my battery loses power, I can kick, I can, I can jump start my bike with a, this battery pack. I also have, uh, have a compressor, a little mini compressor. Um, that's, I think stop and go make them. You know, the, the, the gauge on it stopped working after a little while, but uh, my bike actually has the PSI um, gauges on the, on the actual console. So there's little sensors inside the bike, um, which is really good for, um, you know, when you go off road and just deflating the tires. Um, a lot of people ask you, uh, what, what should you deflate the tires to? Well, depending on what you're riding on, um, this sort of stuff I would deflate by about, like I'd have the, normally my, my um, front is about 30, 35, 36 PSI, and I'd take that right down to about 17 on, on gravel. And then on, um, on sand, you pretty much want to get it down. I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but seven, six, seven, eight PSI is pretty much fine. Um, but you've got to have confidence that you're you're not going to have any issues with your with your tyres. So if you're going to do that, sometimes I didn't even bother doing it. It was just like look at the, see the people just riding. They drive everyone, all the locals drive just basically in the middle of the road. You know? So when you're hitting the corners, unless you can, if you can't tell, you're best to really hug the inside. Um, so this, so anyway, getting back onto the ride today, um, I'm riding up to a. a a volcano here. We came across quite a few trucks because the only the only way that anyone gets any service for anything, whether it's gas, food, anything, is by is by truck. Um, and up in these little mountain villages, and we, you end up getting up pretty high. Um, and w so much so, when you're in all your riding gear, another thing, another smart move. If you're going to go up hiking up high, and you're riding up there, a smart move is to get a change of clothes so you've got some light clothes. And that's again why I've got the side case and so I can put my gear in there. And, um, you know, I just had a pair of shorts and a t-shirt underneath. 
take take all the gear off for when you walk because you do get really tired really quickly. Especially when you're acclimatising. Um, and some of the su southern the southern capitals, Peru and and in Ecuador and all that, they're very big, high, um, you know, places like you know, even in uh, uh, Cuenco, uh, is, uh, in Peru, you're up. You know, I, I ended up staying in a place right up high in the in the you know like eight, ten thousand feet up, whatever, and just walking around town, and I had to walk up a big, huge hill to get to my apartment. Um, and so you, you do find that you out of, get out of breath fairly quickly, and not that I'm the fittest guy on the planet either. So, um, but yeah, so the idea was to get here was to get up as high as I possibly could, up into the mountains, and you can now now I'm onto the dirt. Um, and there's a little village down below on the water, really beautiful uh, place uh, by the, by this gorgeous lake, and there's people swimming in the lake and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going down at the moment. As you can see, it's still beautiful. And, um, uh, beautiful and sunny and um, heading right down now into this little village I've got the video sped up so I'm not going this quick obviously um, and uh, and then I was making my way up a, a road and then I got to it where it was a single track and it was really just a walking track like I, there was no way now I was going to get my bike up there and felt a little bit uneasy about leaving my bike in the middle of nowhere and walking up and what happened was the clouds came over the top of the mountain so it was only just at the peak where the volcano was but it was just fully covered so I waited for about 45 minutes and then decided oh well it's not going to happen for me today um, which is a bit sad because some other people got some amazing photos because this, this volcano it's not while well, it's not spewing out uh, lava or anything like that it is still quite active you know? I think at last, at last uh, had, had its big, uh, a big eruption in 2014, um, which basically covered the cities, the major city, Guatemala City, Antigua, in ash. Um, you look at that, it's beautiful, isn't it? There's nothing, there's nothing open here on this day. It was pretty much, well, pretty much dead, the city. And I stopped off, had a bit of a break just here on the right. There we go, nice little shaded spot sat by the water for a while. That's Antigua, that's looking back into Antigua, that's where I started from. Beautiful, beautiful city. So this is going up into uh, into the mountain and um, yeah, the, when, you, when you're riding on, on, on off-roading as well, you've got to basically sit on the tracks. If you get into the middle, you start slipping everywhere. Um, and with me and with the camera, because I've got to, to take a photo, I've got to reach across my arm. And every now and then I do that and all oh, start slipping her a little bit, you know. Um, here's a guy just going up the top of the mountain and carrying wood down. You know, it's sort of like when I look at the life of these people, I sort of part admire and part feel a little bit sorry for them. The admiring thing is, you know, for a lot of people, if you live by a river that's got fish in it, you've got and you've got your chickens, you've got your, your food on your farm. You're self-sufficient. The pressure to to own uh, to earn money is dramatically reduced. I'd rather be poor in any one of these countries than poor in in uh, in, in one of our countries. You know, um, and I'll explain that. Uh, so if you're poor in say let's just say where, I, where I'm currently residing in Miami Beach, it costs you just to basically live each month. That's just to live in a one bedroom apartment and be able to afford food, electricity, your internet, your phone. You're pretty much up for two and a half to three thousand US dollars a month. That's what you're up for. Now you can halve it, you can quarter it, you can divide it up a, a fair bit. Um, if, you, if you're living with somebody else in a one bedroom apartment, you get a two bedroom apartment, you're looking at four, four and a half thousand a month. That's with all the expenses as well. The cost is about three and a half grand a month here for a two bedroom apartment uh, to rent. So now if you live here here in Peru, um, oh, so yeah, if you live here in Guatemala, for instance, and you're poor, this is where I'm starting to work out what's going on here. Soon to be going down again. I'm supposed to be going up to that mountain on the right there. You can see the clouds starting to come around it. 
Um, so if you're poor in Peru in say this village here, and you've got chickens, you've got food, you need to have obviously a, a fire to, for cooking, you've got to clean the wood, you've got to, you've got to somehow boil the water, fresh water, unless you can get some sort of filtration system going, which you can quite easily with coal or with the, with the byproduct of a fire um, and, and stuff like that. Um, you can create your own food, There's, the forests are full of fruit and stuff like that. So there is a chance for you, to, and you're not having to work every single day for crappy wages. So in, in, in some sense, this is a better thing, you know. The, the things you don't have is healthcare, dental, all this sort of stuff. And I mean, in America, you pretty much don't anyway. Um, but yeah, so just thinking about that, I always think about those sort of things, you know, where would I rather be? And I'd rather have the freedom. Like here, you see, you'll, you'll go through towns and you'll see kids playing in outside all the time. You know, they go to school still, and the school's free in most of these South Southern American countries. I'm trying to work out why am I going down? And then I've worked out that the track was back the other way. The single track was back the other way. Um, this is just looking back into Antigua. I love, I love what my sister and uh, Billy did with the design of my bike. I love, I love the, the three inch stickers that I've Some amazing views. You, know, you probably can't see them as well from here. I think I decided to keep going down and around. As you can see now, the clouds start to move in and sort of can't be ruining my day. Oh no, this is going back up. Yeah, so I've basically given up the drone idea and that the volcano, which is a bit unfortunate, but... So you can see I'm getting the tripod out. It's going to take a little bit of a shot with the view. A lot of the towns have these cobblestones as you enter into little villages. The cobblestone roadways, I don't know how they're better, but... They must take a long time to build. They're fantastic little villages, you know. That was where I stopped earlier by the lake to the left where all these kids playing in the water. It's pretty cool. Um, so what I'm, what I'm also going to talk about today is my backpack. Um, it's called uh, the Climb uh, Crew Backpack. Um, basically it has a water, uh, has a what you can see it on my back there. It has a water, um, you know, uh, what do you call it, the, a water pack in the back um, with a tube that goes into your mouth. Fantastic, oh, holds about two, uh, three litres of water if you want to fill it up that much. Um, what I suggest is with any backpack is that behind you on the bike on a long trip, you don't want to be having that strain on your shoulders by having too much weight in your backpack. And even then, I would suggest having a bag behind you where you can actually, when you're sitting on the bike, it's actually, the, the backpack actually sits on top of it, so it takes all the weight off the backpack. I worked that out, out of, after about a few days that, um, that it was so much more comfortable to do it that way. Everyone always waves again. Pretty cool. So, um, yeah, so the backpack, it has two uh, spot slots on each side to put your tripod. It's got a little, a little zipper at the back uh, also, that uh, you can put your, you know, some loop, some change in, which I used to carry the loose change if I went shopping or anything. Gave me change, I put it in. I only, ha it's got a strap around the waist and then a strap around the chest. You just lo loosen the strap around the chest and then bring the wa waist one around, so you can actually, on top of your bike, you can just pull the backpack around to the front of you and do what you need to do. But I, in my backpack, uh, and it, even though it's not waterproof, it pretty much is. Like it, I never got water into it, even when it rained really heavily. Um, and it, it's not rated water resistant, but the, the backpack has been designed because it's actually a snow a, a snow uh, a snow bike, whatever you want to call them, I can't remember what they're called, uh, backpack. And that's why it's so cheap as well. I'm not sure if they're still doing it because I'd be disappointed if they are, but I heard from someone that they're no longer producing it, which is pretty crazy considering it's probably the best backpack out for motorbiking. And then you've got uh, an area where you can put your spare gloves, a little case, uh, a little bag to put your spare gloves, clips out and you can just pull it out and put it back in. Uh, you, got, you can put a, it's got a protection uh, shell on the back of it. It's also got, um, it's also got two, two big areas where you can put stuff. 
so you can put your laptop in there if you want. Uh, but I kept I kept my um, I kept my uh, documents in there, so I, I I had a thing. You know, the whole trip was um, I never w ever went anywhere without my uh, passport. All my documents are always with me, and you'll find that when you go into some uh, restaurants and stuff like that, they'll ask, uh, not restaurants, um, grocery stores, the bigger ones, they'll ask you to remove the backpack and leave it on the desk with them. And I just said, no, I just go somewhere else because the security of that is deplorable. They just put them on a table and, we, and you give a ticket. You know, 99 out, 9,999 times out of a um, 10,000, 999 times out of a thousand, nothing will happen. But that one time, it just ruins your trip. So, and in, so I'd have my passport and then I'd have my documents. I'd have my documents for the country I was in, in one um, plastic, fo uh, plastic sleeve. And then I'd have all my, my copies of my documents in another plastic sleeve. Um, I'd have my passport with me. And then again, I'd have another folder in, my, in one of my cases with copies again of everything. I'd also had, I also had a memory card in, in one of my cases that had, that had the digital versions of each one. So if I ever lost them, I always had backups of everything. And then I'd also, on Google Drive, I'd have copies of everything. So if I needed to access them, to copy them, I could just do that uh, pretty pretty uh, formats. So that, that to, me, to me, you know, losing your wallet is one thing, and that's a bad thing as well. Um, what I'd also have it in, my, in, my, in my pants, my writing pants, I'd have my wallet, and then and then I'd have my, another wallet on my tank bag, and the other wallet was a fake wallet. Okay, so the fake wallet had I, before I left, I got a I, I got a copy of my driver's license. Um, like I said, I lost it, and they gave me another one, um, and then uh, my credit cards, uh, all all different bits and pieces that I had copies of in this other wallet, and I'd always have about forty dollars on. So if anyone ever held me up or any situation, I could just. Uh, you know, hand over the wallet. If someone's going to rob you on your bike, and it didn't happen, didn't even look like happening, but if it was going to happen, they're in a rush. So you giving them your wallet, they want to be out of there. None of those cards will work. It's useless to them, but a great a great thing to have, a backup wallet. And I've, I've been using backup wallets for years. So I'd have my real wallet in a certain place, um, and they're usually not open to someone to look look at and then I'd always have a backup wallet with me um, you just never know and uh, it's just a it, well one it could save your life and don't put one dollar with it you want the person who's going to rob you if they're going to rob you you want them to get get away with something 40 60 US dollars is what normal person might carry around with them um, so just be prepared to lose that with a bunch of fake cards they're, they're real cards and they have real expiry dates on them um, but you know, all you've got to do is say, I've lost my cards and my cards are being, you know, getting a bit damaged and you send me some new ones. And they'll send you the new ones and the old ones won't work anymore. Um, okay, so that's that. So I'd have always had that in my backpack uh, for, for any, any scenario, you know. Um, so getting pulled over by the military police, uh, checkpoints, anything like that, you, you've got them at the ready. Um, what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't have too much weight in your backpack. So the way I organise my bike is on in one of my cases I had all my tools, in one of the other cases I had my camping equipment, like cook, cooking stuff. Um, and you know the camping equipment basically adds a quarter to your weight if you're going to do camping. Um, and you know you really want to go through you know, everything you want to have is you want to have lightweight stuff. And I've learned a few lessons from this trip that, that I won't take into the, you know, the, what you find on your trip is the things that you'd like to have um, with you and the things you actually need are two different things. Um, and I think you want to be comfortable in a, in a, in a tent. So what you would have with your, uh, your, with your camping gear is you have your tent. Uh, my tent was five kilos, it's called a Lone Rider. Um, uh, Moto tent, or mine's called Moto tent two. It's about five hundred dollars from from Europe, and it, it, you can not only it's, it sleeps too, but you can also park your bike under under shelter. So if it's raining, 
depends where you're going and whether you need to have that, but not a bad thing to have uh, for security as well. Um, then I'd have a sleeping bag, a lightweight sleeping bag, especially in South America. It wasn't going to be that cold except for in Patagonia. I'd have a, uh, I had a, one of these uh, um, mattresses that you just blow up, like a, uh, a you know, blows up to about. You don't want to have one. You don't want to have one of those foam rolls because they they just don't give you enough. Unless you're going to be camping on sand, they're not going to give you any comfort. So you've got to have a blow up mattress. Um, I think. Uh, so then I'd have the sleeping bag, blow up mattress, and I had two blow up pillows. For some reason, I don't like one pillow. I like to have two. So I had two little blow up pillows that fit fit, fit inside your fist. Um, and then I'd also I'd also have, I bought a ground sheet as well for the tent to put underneath the tent, just so that the tent's always clean, because uh, you don't want to be packing a tent up and having dirt and crap inside it and getting mouldy and stuff like that. So I'd uh, I'd have a I'd lay the, the sheet down first, and then and then uh, have the tent uh, on top of that. Just makes it easier, and you can just that one sheet's the only thing you need to clean. Uh, cleaning inside the tent's pretty easy. Some people want to bring a little broom handle and that with them. You know, just wipe it out with your hand. It's just extra weight you don't need. Um, and you, in, instead of having a chair, just use one of your side cases. You know. The chair is just a bunch of extra weight that you don't need to put on your bike. Um, yeah, so that, that was pretty much the camping gear. Cooking equipment, the, the, the burner, a little pot pan. Again, go for minimal as much as you can. The thing is, every single person that sets out on their first adventure will make the same mistake I'll make, I made. And the first, my first really big adventure. And, and, that's, and that's you just take too much stuff with you, you know. Beforehand, when I've travelled solo and I've hired rented motorbikes and stuff like that, beforehand, I, I've travelled for four months with one backpack. I have a backpack and then I have a computer bag, computer camera bag, for four months. One backpack and one computer bag. Number one is, you know, I was flying a lot of that, a lot of those trips, and I don't want to be waiting for luggage. So I just say, okay, the thing is, you become a bit of a stinker, you know, you're wearing the same shorts all the time. Um, you know, the, I have this little, I, I have this little bag that, that's with me to washing as well. But basically what I do is if I was staying more than one night in a place, I just have a bath um, and I put all my dirty clothes in the bath, wring them all out, wash them with soap and wring them all out and just hang them up. I've got that little, a little, uh, little wire thing that you can like a little hanger thing a rubber thing it's a really cool thing and I'll, I'll be reviewing all these things later but that's really really cool and uh, you can hang that on the balcony or hang it outside or hang it inside the bathroom and you can dry your clothing on that but you know unless you've got a dryer you basically you need an you need a full day to dry all your clothes so there's all these little things but everything you know a lot of the first generation things I bought just ended up being too heavy you know I mean, your tools are really heavy shit, you know, all your wrenches and all that sort of stuff. So there's companies that you can look online, companies that build a full toolkit just for your motorbike. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the company. I'm, if I can, if I can find out who, who it is, I'll put it on there. So the, the, the toolkits that come from the manufacturer are really always basic, they come with your motorbike. They don't actually perform all the tasks you need to perform when you're on a long trip. Um, and there's just little things like I've got plastic things for changing tires um, and a, a wrench for the changing tire, lightweight wrench but super strong, a lot more expensive to get those um, that, that type of steel or whatever they use for, uh, for that but so much lighter. Everything matters because base, basically once you pick all your things you want then you go and weigh them all, you want to shave probably 20%, 30% off that weight. And it does come down to how much of a budget you have and I understand all that sort of thing, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I rode, if you look at my gloves there, I, 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 for the basic riding, uh, unless I was doing really serious off-riding, I'd just wear the lightweight tires. Not clever, but so much more comfortable than the big heavy tires that just sweat, sweat in. Uh, it's always a good idea to, if you've got the big heavy tires, uh, uh, gloves and their um, the, the heavy duty ones 
and you're not going to use them until the end of your trip or on certain things is just get used to wearing them for little parts of each trip just so they get a little bit more elasticity in them because it can be when you when you're driving riding off road you want to be really you want to be be able to feel everything on your bike the clutch the uh, the brake and all that sort of stuff and when they're really tight and heavy um, yeah, when they're when they're really tight and heavy you basically want to um, make sure that uh, trying to think of what, what I was doing here. I think I just had a, had a sit down for a minute there. Um, when they're really tight and heavy, you don't want to have that feeling on a bike when you're doing off-road. You want to be able to featherweight touches on the clutch and, and stuff like that. I mean, I, when I was in Patagonia, I, the, I, I stopped off and uh, uh, this this uh, this couple were riding and, and the girl had completely worn out her clutch. Uh, her clutch had gone. Um, she was on a BMW and um, it was really rough going on the road, but that was the end of her trip, basically. Um, I figured that that's what they, they ended up, there was a, a four-wheel drive that stopped and was gonna load her bike on. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is catastrophic, you know? <laughs> and it probably wasn't her fault because it was really, really tough going. I mean, I was even going a bit crazy on my clutch as well, so. Some nice little photos here of the of the coming into the town of Antigua. I'm trying to think of what where's the place that I uh, that I stayed in um, in Antigua. It was a coffee plantation. Um, yeah, I'll try and find out uh, FIFA or Fila uh, coffee plantation. Yeah, it's Villa Delphia uh, Coffee Resort and Tours. Um, yeah, I was, I mean, you know, it was a pretty expensive place that I was staying in. Um, maybe $160 a night, which is not exactly what I intended to do. And internet, you know, every, the, the, the thing about all these uh, expensive places just have every excuse under the sun while they're, why they're, uh, why their internet is down. It's just so frustrating. Um, having to deal with that sort of crap, you know, with, with, uh, with, you know, when you're spending that sort of money and they come up with crap, you should be able to get a massive reduction in price. Because I, one thing I do is before I book, whether it's a hotel or whatever, I say, you, you, you've quoted uh, high speed internet, I depend on that to, for doing business. And if it's not high speed internet, then I'll, I'll expect a full refund and, and I'll find somewhere else to stay. And they all say, yeah, yeah, no worries. Then you get there and it's just like pathetic, you know? But this was in a pretty cool little place. I'm obviously going somewhere wrong here, I think. Um, but it was in a cool spot and uh, and um, it was it was quite beautiful. But again, you know, uh, the internet is a thing that really killed me in certain places, you know? And just the fact that they lie to you, you know, I mean, you can't lie about anything else, but you can lie about your internet, you know. I mean, you can't say, oh, we've got power and the power's out 50% of the time, you know. Here yeah, I am lost. And they're lost again. <laughs> So this is a, a gated place and rooms were okay. You have to, every time you get there, no one recognizes you, so you've got to give them your details each and every time. It was a pretty cool place, though, I've got to say. There was a, a Royal Enfield, an old Royal Enfield bike there as well. Um, it was quite beautiful, you know. Um, I think I've got a photo of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's where I parked my bike. I'm sure I had the, there was a, a motorbike, the Enfield, somewhere here. This is just 
coming into the roundabout. Oh yeah, so you have to go through two gates, that's right. <laughs> it's crazy what you're going to do in these sort of places. And it looked like they were having a wedding there that weekend or something. There's staff everywhere as well, you know. I saw, I just, I think I saw that bike, the motorbike there and thought, oh, I don't know, look at that. And this is just, I, I just went back into the town and, and had a bit of a look around. This is the main square. Again, again, you can see that Spanish colonial sort of uh, influence on the area. <laughs> so much junk on my bike. It's a bit of a, bit of a challenge. Uh, if you don't use the centre stand, um, if you don't park on level surfaces, you've got to be a little bit careful. See, it takes me a while to get on off the bike. That's pretty, pretty, pretty nice. Though. Sweat like a pig under the helmet. Back to photos. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so uh, that was my little trip to get, get up to a volcano that I never quite got to. Um, it's, uh, it, it, I definitely would visit, you visit, I'd skip Guatemala City. Um, you can you can stay there if you want and have a look around if you want, but um, the, the, main, the main place to stay, I think, is Antigua. Uh, I think I have a bit of a sit down here. Um, the main place to stay is Antigua. Antigua. But anyway, guys, uh, any any questions or comments, uh, just uh, leave them below and I'll answer them as soon as I can. Thank you.